guys, how are you? Uh, welcome to Getting from Can't to Can. My name is Jason Moore. I'm a psychologist who specializes in helping entrepreneurs and professionals move forward and deal with challenging situations and to get the results they need by enhancing their effectiveness. It's really what I'm all about is helping people get unstuck, unstressed and clear. And I work one to one with business owners and their teams. I provide talks and workshops and well-being and development programs. So my background is in the psychology of performance, development and well-being. Um, and that's why I set up the Practical Psychology Meetup in order to facilitate events with myself and other psychologists and coaches to help people address problems in these areas. Um, so if you would like to join the meetup, uh, there is links in the chat as well. Um, and there's lots of other free talks coming up. So the next one, I'm speaking on procrastination on Wednesday, April 27th. And the wonderful Kaloda McComiskey is coming to speak to us about the power of meditation on May 12th at 6.30 as well. Uh, again, there'll be links there for those. So tonight's event is Getting from Can to Can with the wonderful Mary Corbett. Uh, so Mary is a life and business coach from County Cork. Uh, she's been coaching officially since around 2009 and her, in her own words has been around the block. Uh, Mary is a graduate of applied psychology from University College Cork and she has worked as a software management consultant and IT project manager previously also. So Mary's focus tends to be on career coaching and professional performance as well as coaching through weekly challenges. If you check out her website in around areas like resolution, diet, and exercise. Uh, an interesting fact about Mary is she has presented at a conference with 100 speakers and has been the only woman at said event. Uh, without further ado then, I shall pass you over to Mary. Good evening, everyone. And Jason, thank you so much for inviting me to speak here this evening. Um, just while I'm getting my slides organized and, and sharing the screen, you know, the idea of getting from can't to can is a really, really powerful uh, idea because oftentimes we really have to be aware of a lot of whether we succeed or not is caught up in our mindset. And I'd like to start with a really famous uh, quote from Henry Ford, whether you think you can or you can't, you are right. What goes on inside our heads is so very powerful. And I think currently being very aware of, you know, we've all come through COVID. We're now adapting to a new way of living and working with COVID there in the background all the time. We've had to deal with changes to how we interact with people, changes to how we work, huge levels of uncertainty, the levels of feedback we get has all changed. And so what's really interesting is that the one person we've stayed talking to through all of this has been inside in our heads. It has been those thoughts that are inside our heads. And sometimes they can work in our favor and sometimes they work against us. And what I want for everybody here listening to the call, I want, what I want you to get from it is I want you to understand at the end of this call a lot more of the power of your mindset. And the model I'm going to use is one called positive intelligence. And this, you know, when other people started COVID, they were, they were making banana bread. I went looking for new psychology models that might be useful to my clients. And the model of the positive intelligence model is one that focuses very much on this idea of us having both a mental saboteurs and having a sage brain and understanding the interplay between the two. So I want to present this to you and also connect it to how you can use that knowledge as you're going through your daily life. And of course, over the course of this evening, I want to give you a couple of little exercises that you can do in the middle of your workday that will help you switch off those mental saboteurs and give that sage brain of yours a chance to come into play. So I'm going to start because lots of you will have rushed in here. You know, you're just finishing up work and you're trying to get yourselves organized. And the best way we can learn is when we're in a state of calm. So what I would like to do with, as long as it's safe for you to do so, is for to just to take a moment to still the brain, 
to still the thoughts from the day, all the worries, all the fears. Let's just calm, quieten things down. So what I would like you to do is I would like you to, you know, take the time, close your eyes if you find it more comfortable. What I want you to do is I want you to take a couple of really deep breaths. And so we're going to start breathing in quite slowly to the count of five. Hold and out. And now with this next breath, as you breathe in, be very aware of the temperature of the air as it hits your nostrils. Feel your chest expanding as you take in that air. Be aware of your body and how it's reacting to your big deep breath. And slowly back out again. And again, be aware of the temperature as of your breath as it leaves your nostrils. And we'll do one more breathing in, hold and out. And just feel how much your body calms down. Our breath is one of the most powerful tools we have all have with us at all times that we can use to actually stay really tuned in to our bodies and stay calm. And we really can use it all of the time. So the, as I mentioned, the model I'm going to talk about to you about this evening is what's known as the positive intelligence model. And this isn't me having come up with a model. I don't claim to be that brilliant. But Shirzad Shamin, who is from uh, Stanford University, he has spent a number of years studying this, trying to understand how can we put a model together that is easy for people to understand and that will help them achieve happiness and success. So his positive, what he asserts is that the science and practice of developing mastery over our own mind allows us to reach our full potential, both for happiness and success. And that is the fundamental principles underlying his model. Uh, looking at all the research that psychology has been doing. And what I want you to think about is, think about all the colors you can see in the universe. And in the end of the day, when you get to the root, the core of our colors, it's based on three color receptors in our eyes. Our blue, yellow, and red receptors. But yet we can see a, a whole rainbow of colors. He took the psychology and all the wonderful pieces of research that have been done, and he tried to get to the root cause as well. So he's looked at research from positive psychology, from neuroscience, from performance science, from cognitive psychology. And what he has decided is that sitting in at that root core is what he calls his model of positive intelligence, which breaks down what is at the core. And what he has concluded is that we have three core foundations for our mental functioning. We have a saboteur brain, we have a sage brain, and we have a self-command muscle that decides whether we go into saboteur, we go into brain or into sage. And so the idea is, it's, it sounds really simple and it's put together to say, what is at the root of everything? How can we understand how our minds are functioning so that, and how these magnificent brains we've got function so that we can actually get a handle on it in a way that makes sense to us and how we deal with the world. And so essentially what, what I want to point out is we focus on the fact that in the end of the day, the human brain is a muscle. And so he's breaking it down is that, that there's a muscle group called the saboteur brain. There's a muscle group called the sage. And you know the fitness is the bit that's of command in between the two. The, the key to all of this is that all of us have internal saboteurs. So when we talk about getting from can't to can, it's when we have a project that we want to achieve or we have a goal that we've set ourselves and then we get that inner voice, that inner voice that says, we can't do this. We, well, how could we succeed? Why would we be able to manage this? So. It's that saboteur functioning. And it, when we take time to understand that when we are thinking and our brain goes into saboteur mode, there's simply 
thoughts, they don't necessarily reflect a reality in the real world. They are the thoughts that are going on in our brains, but our brains don't know the difference whether they're real or not real. Our brains only know what we tell them. Now, we're all aware, I, I, I wouldn't say there's anybody in this call who's not aware of their own, that they sometimes have an inner judge who says they're not quite good enough, they may not achieve. But what's really interesting is that that inner judge also has a couple of accomplices. And sometimes these accomplices look like they're our friends. And the, these nine accomplices are the avoider, a controller, a hyperachiever. And I'm going to spend some time now explaining these different models. And as I go through them, what I want you to think about is, do I recognize that myself? When I'm stressed, is, is that what I might be doing? Is that where my, my thoughts go? Or if I have somebody that I was dealing with maybe earlier today and go, mm, I wonder, was that their judge? Or was that their, them just being, con their controlling thoughts that were kicking us? Because when we actually pay attention to it, we can recognize it both in ourselves and equally in others. So you will find that these different accomplices will make more sense when you can connect them to the behavior that somebody else has. So let's get stuck in the judge. We all have the judge. Um, I'm very good on the judge. I've had the judge for years that says I, I, you know, I, I couldn't do presentations or the judge that says I can't become good at social media or the judge that says, well, why would I be able to make it as a coach? When other, you know, other people can do it, but I can't. Why could, you know, I won't get the promotion. I won't get the advancement. I won't. One of the challenges is that when we get our inner judge starts taking over our thoughts, what happens is that we focus on what's wrong and we focus on what that others are superior to us or that we are inferior. And so it does matter what that just does, because when we get caught up in that thinking, our experience is that we get a lot of anger, we get a lot of anxiety, we get guilt, we get shame. I'm sure you're all recognizing these emotions. But what's going on is it's, it's, it's their thoughts. That connection to, well, is it factually, is it real? We need to pay attention to it. And so we often have a bias towards the negative. Now, there was a, a, a recent experience I had was I was um, parked in a car park. Um, it was nighttime and I got out of my car. And as I was getting out of my car, I tipped and no, meant, no, I'm using the word very carefully. I tipped the door of the car next to me. And the other driver was sitting in his parked car and got out to give out to me. I was, and instantly, why had I not parked elsewhere in the car park? I was, and it's continuing that theme, I was been um, mansplained that, you know, I was a female driver was the implication and I should have parked where there was more space. He was very much in judging me mode. I was fortunate in that I was able to stay calm and not engage with his judge. And that is what helped me just completely diffuse the situation and say, check with him that his car wasn't marked, be very calm and walk away. So we have to be very careful. The challenge we all have is that when our judge is very active, whether it's of ourselves or of others, is that we can very much get caught up in the emotional response with the other person and you get two judges going it makes for a it makes for an argument but probably not a very effective one so if when we are feeling these judge thoughts and we're going i'm going to come back to this later and we can stay calmer and not let our judge take over our thoughts that then get directed to our speech we end up handling the situation way more effectively now, the avoider is another accomplice that I am very, very good at. I love the avoider. I've been an avoider for years. I love calm. And I spent many years down saying, holding the calm, everything was all right. Everything is pleasant. 
but I could be damn passive aggressive when I wanted to be. And I was resisting, but I didn't deal directly with the situations. So oftentimes, if you have an avoider um, accomplice operating, what happens is you're getting highly resentful, but rather than and you know have the discussion and clear the air you kind of go oh i'm oh i'm afraid i won't go near it and we avoid conflict because we believe that the we lose our connection with the other person so an avoider you know accomplice it builds resentment it actually causes problems even though we think we're holding this wonderful balance and keeping everything calm now the controller i worked in it project management for a number of years. I have seriously encountered controllers. And you often find controllers in positions of authority. They often, you'll often find them with strong energy. But the challenge is they want to control the situation. They it's their way or the highway. So when it's taken to it, but it's coming not from a place of calm, but from a place of anxiety. So they won't let others be involved. They won't allow for other people's connections. So we have to be very, you know, they want just everybody to, they want to take charge and control. There can be an element of it where it's effective, but there's equally when we are caught up with that controller accomplice, with that negative side of it, that saboteur type of controller, then it becomes that it's not working in our favor. So it's associated, it will be that the person who has a high controlling as accomplice saboteur will also have high anxiety and will be very impatient with the feelings of others and or people's other alternative styles. So the uh, one we often encounter in the workplace, so to be aware of it, once you're aware of it, you can be calmer and you just recognize it for what it is. Moving on from that, there's the hyper-rational. This one I find very found very challenging when I began to get to know it because I've always loved people who were rational, who were very clear-headed, and I always saw it as a strength. The challenge is, is if you're hyper-rational from a saboteur perspective, what is happening is that you do, everything is unrational to the, ex you ignore, feelings, you ignore feelings and emotions. And you can often come across as being very cynical of other people and very skeptical because you get so frustrated with them. So it's a sense of the hyper-rational has strengths and it has served us well, you know, at times, but we have to be mindful when it gets to extreme and when it's operating from a saboteur perspective. The hyperachiever, I'm sure you've all encountered them, particularly in the workplace. That's the person who wants to be the best. The challenge is, is that a, a hyperachiever who is caught with their saboteur is very much caught up on the, the achieved goal. And then they forget to celebrate because they're already moved on to get the next goal. Everything about their sense of self is about chasing the next achievement. You often find it with workaholics and you keep people and their emotions at a safe distance. So uh, I, I don't have this one and it's one I don't understand. I've seen it in others, but it's not one that I ha have had for myself. I like to do well, but not at the expense of people. I'm too busy avoiding to, not to cause stress and people pleasing to actually be the high, hyper achiever. So are these making some sense to you? Because this is, is, is very much I want you to be aware of. There's elements of these uh, saboteurs that seem like they're good, but underlying them is if they're done to extreme, they cause problems. The pleaser is another one that um, I'm very at home with the pleaser. I'm a pleaser. Um, I'm the challenge of the pleaser is the pleaser always wants to rescue people. I spent many years rescuing people. I've got better. I now support people, but it isn't. It comes from a place where I originally used to res rescue people. Oftentimes, what happens though is that if you have a pleaser saboteur, is that you're so busy, you know, oh, oh, I have to do this that overly helpful, that overly solving people's problems, and it comes across as neediness because they have to be at the center of minding things, and on behind it then is that over time, people just don't deal with you 
they just avoid telling you. So you, you everything suffers from it. The hypervigilant is a really interesting one because you often find hypervigilance among firefighters, emergency doctors, <laughs> emergency nurses, and, and anybody involved in critical safety. They are they have this they're constantly looking for danger. Now, if you think about the origin of the human race, being hypervigilant once upon a time in our deep distant past, being hypervigilant was a really good thing. But nowadays, very few of us need that level of hypervigilance. Oftentimes, though, is that they feel they'll doubt that somebody who's hypervigilant as a saboteur doesn't feel that anybody else can pay attention to danger. And they're constantly looking for the mishap. They're constantly expecting the danger to happen. And so you'll often find them working in roles where they have very tight procedures to very tight rules. So there's a time when it works well and there's a time when it can actually cause problems. But somebody who's caught up in that hypervigilant, you'll find them getting very overwhelmed about potential dangers and they get into extreme levels of anxiety. So it can work against them in a huge way. The restless person, how do I describe the restless? I don't have this too much. But I recognize that I have, I, have, I have had colleagues in the past who've had this one. I, I once worked with another IT project manager who was really good at starting projects, but they never finished them. They never, because they were constantly looking for the next new project, the next new piece of te technology to apply. So somebody, they're always looking for the next thing. So oh, what can happen then is that they, they get distracted. And so they don't do it. It is commonly, it is found in a lot of people who have that serious fear of missing out. They get impatient with what's in the now because they're looking for the next best thing. So the restless one can be quite challenging for people, particularly in work. It can be also exceedingly challenging inside in relationships because that is where if the person's always looking for the next thing, the next adventure, the next excitement, it's very hard to be present and fully present in what is happening in the now. And they're always wanting more. Stick I like sticklers. Sticklers is, a, a, is one that I really, really love because sticklers are really good at quality control. If you have a stickler in quality control, you know, they'll make sure the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. However, the stickler could be so busy at work trying to write the report that they never could get that perfect report, but they never get it finished and they end up in trouble. So often what happens is they're so busy looking for the getting everything perfect that they actually lose sight of it. So it, it, it's perfectionism is taken too far. I'm sorry, there's apologies. There's a, an error there in the slide. Cut and paste didn't quite work properly. We'll, we'll jump past that. And finally, there's the victim. And the victim is one I've, I, I have a lot of sympathy for because they're very, they, you'll often find victims are very sensitive to emotion, but they take it all very, very personally. Nobody understands them. It's poor me. And they get, they genuinely do spend their time brooding over the negative feelings. So they're always fearful. So it is really, really important that to, yes, you have to recognize it, but it has to be, they have to be minded too, because those feelings are very real for them at the time. It's not one I have, so I do struggle with it a little bit, but I would always be extra careful when I know that somebody has a very sensitive nature and are, they may have a victim saboteur, but I will always err on the side of caution say, they may have a, you know, they really are that sensitive. So care and caution when working with people who, are, who have a victim saboteur, absolutely highly important. Now, so those are fundamentally your saboteurs. I'm quite sure all of you are, for, you know, you can see yourself and others in them. But one of the interesting pieces of the puzzle is, is that that's only half the problem. The challenge is, yes, I can recognize it, but how do I get over to the other side? An interesting fact is that our conscious brain is only processing one thought at a time they may move to different thoughts very quickly 
but it's actually processing one at a time. So we are aware consciously of one thought at a time. So one of the challenges is that if we want to disrupt that, that saboteur brain by giving the brain something different to focus on, we allow the potential for the other side of our brain to kick in and take over and be in control and get solutions. And to give you an example of that, I want to take a minute now just to, I want you to sit and think about something that happened today that actually, or yesterday or in the last few days, that's really annoyed you and irritated you. So I want you to actually start thinking about the situation in your own heads. Think about, you know, you know, were, were, were they, they giving out? Were they, was something not good enough? Were they, they not deliver the work you wanted? What was going on that, that was really irritating you? And I want you to become aware of, as you think about it, what type of thoughts are you having? And if you think, which type of saboteur might it be for you? Become aware of it. Feel, now, what I want you to do is feel, you know, is the body starting to tense up? Can you really feel it? So let yourself get into that emotion of the frustration. Feel the frustration and of, of something that irritated you. And now what I want you to do is I want you to take a nice deep breath. Take one nice deep breath in. Focus on that air coming into your system. Feel your chest rising. Hold and out. And now I want you to take your fingers and I want you to rub your fingers together with just enough tension that you can actually feel the ridges on your fingertips. Really focus on your sense of touch, on feeling the ridges on your fingertips. Be aware of the sensation of touch and now move your fingers against each other, one hand against the other, and be a, totally aware of the sensation of touch. The only thing you're thinking about is the sensation that you are now feeling of touch. And now we'll take another deep breath in and out. And now we're going to give you something a little more interesting to do. If it's safe to do so, and you can, if you have headphones on, I would suggest you take them off, but still be able to hear me. And I want you to become aware of the sounds of your environment. I want you to listen for the furthest away sound that you can actually hear. Just listen out, and become totally aware of that sound in the distance. And now I want you to draw your back self back in to the closest sound you can hear. If you can't hear, you haven't heard your own breath, pay attention to hearing your own breath. And now we'll take one more deep breath and out. And I want you to be aware of where have your thoughts gone? Are you feeling frustrated? Or are you feeling a little calmer? The reality is, is that if we have techniques that we can use to stop our saboteur brain, we can actually stop it in its tracks. And that is why when we stop it in its tracks, it allows our sage brain to come into play. Now, the sage brain is really quite interesting because if we think of ourselves when we were a small child, our sage brain was always there. But because we pay more attention to the negative, because we're always having, you know, as we're growing up, we get told to be careful, we get told to be vigilant, we get told to please people, we get told to avoid danger, we get told, oh, we've trained that left saboteur part of the brain way more and given it way more exercise than we give our sage brain. 
So the important part of the sage brain is to reconnect. It's always been there and it always will be there. So by connecting with it, we allow it to get stronger. And that is the sense in which we want to shift our activity away from that negative saboteur over to the more positive sage. And an interesting thing about is that our sage brain has very interesting powers. And there's to give you a sense of how you can engage as I want to actually take different powers that sage brain has and show you here's how you have it. So we have the explore part. Think of your beginner's mind that when you're in deep curiosity, you're ready to learn everything. That sit, engaging that curiosity when we do it at work, you'll rev many of you may be familiar with people who've done brainstorming, where you're generating ideas without judgment. That's trying to get you into that beginner's mind, that deep curiosity. When we look at things from, when we get curious, our ability to hear the other person goes up. Our ability to see other potential situations goes up so we can be more effective because we are more open to hear possibility. So if we're working on a, 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 a project and you know it's getting stuck, taking time to get out of this being stuck and focus on what potential solutions, what strategies could we have where we do it from a place of absolute curiosity and not judgment, will actually help us to come up with better solutions. The one that I love doing is that, is this innovate power. And this is something I use very, very consistently. So I want you to think of a situation where, you know the way at work, you see somebody, now that we're back in the office, some, or you see the, them looking to get on a Teams call or a Zoom call, or they're sending you an email, and your first reaction when you see them is, oh no, this is going to take me a half an hour. I'm going to be caught. This is, no, no, I don't want to hear from them today. I have too much on. If we can actually calm ourselves, that's, that's pure saboteur brain operating before they hit the, t the desk. But if we can stay calm and say, do you know what? The other person is always 10% right. If I can find the 10%, then I can actually have a different conversation. So my challenge to you is the next time you have an encounter with somebody like that, say, okay, can I find one element that I actually like? Just one element of what they're coming in to talk about. And one that I, I, I had recently, and it actually comes from my team, but I think most of you, I, you know, I'm hoping most of you will follow it. There was a a project manager and one of the team was coming into him with ideas and they were only half baked and they weren't really very good and the see the project manager had been around the block plenty of times so he knew no i don't want to waste my time with them these are not good ideas what happens in reality is if he dismisses the team member coming in with the ideas and then that person goes away deflated and they stop giving ideas but by changing tack and saying, Do you know what, I love the fact that you want to have that you have ideas. I love where that you're trying to find solutions. Let's take one of the solutions and see what happens. Let's discuss it by simply flipping it a little bit and tweaking saying that idea. Let's see how can we explore that and building from a 10% of an idea that was sort of OK, but wasn't brilliant. But then they were able to focus on well, that bit and build from it. So the whole dialogue changes and the team member believes ends up feeling valued and everything works out much better because we all know that if you don't, if you feel valued, you're more likely to work harder. And they themselves realized what was wrong with the idea because they were given time to bounce it off the, the senior manager. And that's this idea of hitting, finding the 10% is so powerful, particularly in with people we in uh, we work with or in families. Finding that ten percent means you can find something a common ground to build from. The navigate power is you know knowing what's important, and that that incident with the car park that I referred to, I knew 
what was important to me was that I got away from the guy who was causing me grief. I knew he had the potential from his manner to completely explode, but decided not to engage with it. And what was important to me was to find a way to diffuse the situation and walk away. That didn't mean I, I kind of didn't get mad afterwards and my, I met my kids afterwards and I ranted for at least a half an hour as to how terrible the man was because I was, was upset by it and he had got under my skin. But in the moment, by being able to stay very calm, I made sure he handled, he knew he'd overreacted. But there was, I diffused the situation. So it gave, meant because I, what was important to me was I had an arrangement to meet my kids. I knew if I got into a sticky situation with him, I was not going to get out in time. So it was important to me. So when we are in navigate mode, what we're looking for is finding what's most important. And the final power we have is about activation. This is about action. And it's very important when we're considering getting from can't to can. When we can pull our brains out of the saboteur, can use our body to calm down and build those activate, we can then focus way clearer. Our ability to focus and be really laser sharp and clear about what our objectives gets way stronger. So we achieve more. And that is why that sense of staying calm has to be used. It is a powerful tool. The challenge is to be able to recognize when we have it. What I will say to you is part of the challenge is it, we can get really good quite quickly at recognizing the saboteurs. We can get really good very quickly at knowing when we are in sage. The challenge is that piece in the middle where we activate the sage muscle through guided exercises. And the reason that so when, when we started this evening, we started with that breathing to calm the day because that put you in a better state for being able to absorb the information. When I went through the different using touch, the, the sound of the distance or using our touch, again, what we're doing is we're using our body to focus our attention, which allows us to stop that saboteur brain functioning, which then gives us the power to go into SAGE. But the challenge is, is that, you know, the brain's a muscle. If I said to you, if you do, will you want to get fit? You know, if you went to the, the, the gym once and you learned about how all the machines work, would that get you fit? That's about learning what the, yeah, it'll get, it'll get you aware, but you actually need practice. So what I would say to people is, is that if you want, you, want to move to get more of this self-control there you do need to go through a process where you regularly and consistently practice i myself and most of my clients will actually have they will do exercises daily usually you know two minutes five minutes ten minutes i do have one guy who's going through major crisis at the moment and he's spending about 10 minutes a couple of times a day just to reconnect with his body because he's getting overwhelmed and we're using guided exercises to do it. It is highly valuable. So that is really, really important. So what I would say to you is if, if, if understand the, the basic understanding is the model sets out, we have a saboteur brain, we have a sage brain, but the practice of using our body, either breath, Eat, basically our senses, use our breath, use touch, use sight. I would have things, I would have, you know, I can take a box of tissues and I can say, right, I can look at that box and really study it. Anything that takes our brain out of the thoughts that are causing us the stress to calm it down. And we can use those techniques and tools literally in the moment. So I would have a, a habit, one of my habits is I will always take a big deep breath before I answer the phone. I will never be still looking at the keyboard and looking at the screen and answering the phone at the same time. 
because that is my recipe for when my saboteur brain will take over. Because I'll think I can be doing the two tasks at once. I can be finishing up and starting the call. I can't. So I've learned time to take breaths. So if we're going into a meeting or um, going into a situation where we know we're likely to be triggered, having exercises that we can do in one or two minutes is a really valuable thing to do and is something that I would highly recommend. So if this is something you'd like, um, I think at the top of the chat, I posted it and I will post it again in a minute, is I've got a calendar link and do feel free to give me a call because I love talking to people. So if this is something that really is interesting for you and that you would like to learn more about, I would love to have the chats with you. Are you absolutely delighted? Thanks, Jason. You put it in the chat for me. I very much appreciate it. I hope you've enjoyed it and that you've got something of value from the call so far and maybe more to come. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Mary. Um, I mean, I actually did some of the kind of starter course of, of uh, Shirzad's uh, original thing. And, and to be honest, I actually probably got more out of what you explained it very, very well. Some of the little nuances I thought were amazing in, in terms of connecting it all together. Thanks very, very much. That was awesome. You're very welcome. It, 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 I have found that it is a really powerful tool set because it, there's, there's a lot of serious research in behind it, which I feel there is a good body of work. I've been very slow for years to, to buy into some of the models that are going because I don't feel the researched enough, but I feel this one is and that's why I've been very much moving towards, you know, using it with my clients and I'm they're having great results with it. Um, excellent. Um, I'm gonna hit you with a few questions if that's okay. Oh, I, will you, you know I love questions. Um, I suppose the first thing, anything reading wise around this um, that you'd recommend uh, for people to get into if they, if they kind of want to follow further or around some of the key ideas or right well the first starting place i would say will be shirzad's own book and i have the link if i just have patience with me there we go and i'll pop it in the chat okay um, the well, amazon link it's actually called positive intelligence is the name of the book and yeah. it is there's the link on amazon we can share all the links and stuff with people that come up because we want to send a video and stuff so we can send it all out and yeah. um, the, the other interesting thing is on Shirzad's own website, which is positiveintelligence.com, you can do a saboteur assessment so you can learn about your own saboteurs. Really interesting, but don't yeah. get hung up on which saboteurs you have. It's whatever ones are prominent on the day get picked up I've done it twice and I've had slight anytime I've done it I get slightly different saboteurs getting a high score that's perfectly normal okay. because your experience is, is, is telling you and anything else around the site like any other books around the I suppose maybe some of the theory it's based on or um sorry no but I have another book that I consider is really really worth a I can you still see me sorry I yeah, yeah, having yeah, problems with my life. okay it's uh Loving What Is by Byron Katie, another really great book. If you're into thinking about where's your thinking going and is it real? Really love her stuff. Fantastic work. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, I suppose another question that's got, guys, sorry, I have, uh, in terms of the, I've allowed that people can unmute themselves as well. Uh, so feel free if you want to stick your hand up or you can uh, unmute yourself and ask a question as well in a moment. Um, Mary, I suppose something else, could you give me, like, how did you get into all this in, in terms of coaching and, and what you do? I'm very curious of, of how you moved from, did you move from IT or? or... Um, it's a long-winded story. I'll try and give it as quickly. I'll give you the short version of it. I, I was always interested in psychology because I came from a very, um, Well, an interesting family background. Every, we, we, we did everything by the rules. Um, we were a very rule-based family and it didn't quite gel with me. So I was always, as a teenager, interested in psychology. Um, psychology allowed me to get furthest away from home possible. So I got to Cork. <laughs> um, that was the rebel in me. 
And then I ended up doing a lot of work in cognitive ergonomics, so a lot of stuff in IT EU research, which then led into, into IT project management, which then I was got bored um, because I really wanted to do the people stuff. And um, very fortunately, Borgash had a very nice package available, um, redundancy package available, and I took it and ran. That was just uh, around the time of the uh, economic collapse. So um, I had to be a little careful what I did. And I had always said to myself, I would do clinical psychology later in life because I didn't want to do it in my 20s because I felt I didn't, hadn't lived enough. So what I did was I said, do you know what? I don't want to be a clinical psychologist anymore. I want to be a coach. And that was the origin of my moving into coaching. And because I had been as a mid-career change, that was where I started. So that was my start of getting me into coaching. Okay, awesome. Um, so I suppose cognition, uh, cognitive ergonomics is... Uh, you, well, design, let's or? put it this way. The master's thesis I did was how the effective use of color and in information display. So how does our brain process things? How do we make design screens and um, make computers your usable just be a, it was a very busy concept back in the late, yeah, wow. in the late 80s early 90s so uh, usability uh, software usability was a, a key part of the type of work i was doing okay so uh, like definitely a connection in terms of what you're doing now in terms of how people understand the world um yeah and why yeah. some yeah and why some people find something easy to use and others find it difficult why sometimes somebody can learn learn how to use a piece of software really quickly and another piece is really really hard and oftentimes when i i found i got caught a couple of times to do some software training and i felt do you know what it had nothing to do with what i was teaching it was to do with where their heads were at when i was actually trying to teach them some were focused some were not and it was it was an interesting experience mm. Cool. Um, I might jump to some questions if that's okay from uh, the audience. Jim Kelly, if you'd like to unmute yourself, Jim, and ask away. I think I'm unmuted, am I? You are Can indeed. You, you are indeed. M Mary, Mary's a good friend of mine and I've followed her work for a number of years, very much so. Just, just to query, Mary, are you familiar with the work of Caroline Miss? and archetypes which derived ultimately from Carl Jung's work because I see parallels with the, the different accomplices and the archetypes that um, Carl Jung. Yeah, uh, well, I was always a fan of Carl Jung. <laughs> um, all you see in the end of the day that the model is only there to try and say, is there a way of explaining it that people can connect with? So yeah, all of that knowledge of the archetypes feeds into it. It's saying, how do we put this together in a way that people can use in their real world, in their uh, life? So that's, and to me, that's why the model, the way it's put together makes sense. So yeah, there, there are very obvious connections to the, the work of Jung, but the idea, the, the, one of the things and one of the reasons why I particularly like this model is it makes sense that people can have things they can do on a day-to-day -day basis that are easy to adapt. Like I would be very, really conscious of the power, say, of, of spending an hour in meditation or yoga, but that's not something you can do. If you've got somebody irritating you in the middle of the day, <laughs> You know, you don't have the hour to spare, but you need to be able to calm the brain down in the moment. And I think that's one of the elements that I really like about this model, because between the model and the actually giving you the skills of those small exercises that you can do to calm the mind, actually is hugely powerful. That's great, Mary. Thank you very much. You certainly achieved what you set out to do. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, Jim, could I ask a favour? Could you share the name of that author in the chat for us as well? I certainly will. Caroline Miss. Caroline Miss. Miss M I S. M M Y S S. Okay, very good. Cool. She's, okay. she's, she's, she's written a, she's written a number of books, uh, archetypes, but uh, what, what one really recommended is why people don't heal and how they can. Okay, I'll, I'll check that out. I'll share that with everyone as well. That's awesome, Jim. Um, I mean, it, it, Mary, it reminds me very much of uh, some of the techniques in sports psychology. So sometimes you'll see in big games, especially 
rugby players often what they'll do is they'll have a really big elastic band on their um wrist yeah and what they'll do is they'll pull it and that little bit of pain brings them back so they're focused on what they're doing rather than reacting to to what's going on around them um, yeah. um i have done that with uh, something very similar with people who are heading for um job interviews because doing a nice deep breath in the middle of the interview if you get over suddenly get overwhelmed isn't really practical but when i'm prepping clients for interview is i teach them that in the days in the run up to the interview is that taking time each day to use the pressure point so they put their thumb on their um a pressure point in the middle of their palm middle finger behind and squeeze slightly and do their breathing exercise at the same time and you trick the brain because inside in the interview you know your hands are at the desk or with zoom it's much easier you don't see it on, on camera they can use the pressure point and they've taught their brain this is my heart to slow i calm, and it works really really effectively okay uh that's an awesome little hack it's, it's a great one i love i love hacks because we need things in the moment absolutely okay um just to just ask is anyone else claire marie you're you're waving your hand there yes and no, i just it's just saying to just put a pressure just put pressure on it yeah it's literally it's an acupressure pressure point so okay. it's one that's associated with anxiety so if there is a connection to acupuncture which i will admit i don't i'm not an expert in so it's your thumb in the middle of your palm uh, yeah. like that yeah your middle finger coming the other side to meet it and it's literally just a little bit so that you can feel the pressure okay just you're just pressing to show pressure yeah yeah okay perfect thank you and when you associate that with your breathing that means you have something you can do and your brain thinks well i've when i feel that pressure i you've been practicing that you breathe which will automatically give you calm so you, the link is made okay thank you thank you fantastic cool okay um have we got any last questions we're probably getting we're getting close to the hour but uh, we'll take one or two more if anyone has anything they'd like to ask or add no all good okay so i would like to finish up but first off i would like to thank mary ever so much um she did this at relatively short notice uh it was absolute pleasure to have you um and i genuinely mean i, I definitely got some more insight in terms of this topic and despite after doing like i think it was a six-week course i did the first time um i think it connected a little bit very 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 well yeah um thank you thanks so much mary uh we'll share the video um and all mary's details and bits and pieces in an email in the next day or two um i just want to finish up just remind you guys about the next meetups as well i'm speaking on april 27th and uh Koloda mccomiskey is speaking on may 12th i think it is links are all there in the chat as well and again we'll send around details and emails and other than that i'd like to say thanks very much for taking your time out of your day and hopefully we'll start doing some in-person events soon as well as soon as we get some venues sorted uh in the city center so thanks so much for your time. Uh, thanks again to Mary and thanks for all the interaction and the chats guys. And hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Cheers.